What's going on, everyone? You guys awake? Everyone's awake? All right, sweet. My name is Nick Sapinero. I am, as he mentioned, Ernie, uh, the CEO of Divi Labs and a co-founder of a blockchain and cryptocurrency ecosystem called the Divi Project. Um, we'll talk a lot about that at the end, maybe. But I have a lot of things that I want to tell you about and, and discuss with you while we hang out here for the next 25 minutes uh, regarding decentralization, right? Um, and the, the talk is the risk of decentralization or lack thereof. And really, we're worried about losing what we have built cryptocurrency upon, the tenets that Satoshi Nakamoto laid out in the initial white paper and the things that we have worked so hard to build. We're going to talk about Web3, the mainstream and crypto media, CBDCs, regs, self-custody versus third party. Uh, and then we'll just think about how this compares to the real world. If you want to talk to me later for, or follow me on whatever, that's, that's my stuff. All right. The environment that we are living in right now is potentially the most risky in terms of uh, the affront on decentralization. I've never seen in my nine years in cryptocurrency, I mined my first Bitcoin in 2013, I've never seen the ecosystem at so much risk worldwide. There's so many centralized powers that have now admitted that cryptocurrency is here to stay, that now, instead of trying to kill it, they have to figure out how to own it. That could become a problem. Web3 offers us the ability to build the web as it was meant to be built in the beginning, right? Eventually, Web3 or Web1 became Web2, and Web2 was co opted by huge corporations that now own the entire internet. And we don't want that to happen again. Is this an idealistic thought? Can we rebuild the internet? Can we build the next version of the internet the way it was meant to be? Well, I guess it depends who you ask. If you ask Jack Dorsey, he doesn't think so. He thinks it's going to be co-opted by VCs and their limited partners, and he feels that it's a high-risk, uh, zero-sum game, essentially. I disagree with him, which is why I published this article in NASDAQ. It's in our hands, not just the developers, it is in the developers' hands primarily to build things truly decentralized and not waver in our resolve and not take tons of money from people who want to control the new inter internet. But it's also in your hands as consumers. Vote with your wallets. Don't use things that are co-opted by the centralized powers that made everything the way it is right now on the web. Web3 offers us a very significant promise, but not every approach will succeed. And we see that all the time. One thing I don't disagree with Dorsey about is the fact that there is a lot of risk. As there's a lot of risk with any new technology, right? With any new investment class, with any new asset class. And we see it all the time. Networks go down, bridges get hacked, smart contracts get drained. It does happen, which is why, you know, you want to take a methodical approach to your investments, of course, understand the technology that's being built, and eventually, you know, we will get to the point where these issues that exist are resolved. So what's the promise of Web3? It's, it's democratizing the web, and that sounds like a buzzword probably, because it is, but what does it really mean? It means for a long time, we've been using Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and we get monetized. We are the actual product. With Web3, we democratize everything, including finance. You can become your own lender, right? Be your own hedge fund, be your own market maker even. Start your own art gallery with NFTs. It can all be done with Web3 if we do it right. Next thing that puts us at risk, media. It's not just the mainstream. I know we all, how many of you guys love the mainstream media? Not a single hand. Of course, the mainstream media is known for fake news, but so is crypto media. So are certain individuals known for doing things uh, unscrupulously, not naming any names. 
everything in crypto, and I can tell you this firsthand because I own a cryptocurrency project, and I do market that project, and I do have public relations people that reach out to these publications on a daily basis. Every single thing you're reading is pay to play. Everything. Not a single article is not in some way benefiting the person who wrote it. In fact, we just signed one of the biggest deals in the industry with the largest soccer uh, league in the world, and we submitted our story to a bunch of publications, reputable publications, only like three picked it up. But then you also have the mainstream, right? The false narratives that propagate across uh, all the mainstream narratives. Bitcoin's for money laundering, it's going to zero, it's backed by nothing. You know, oh, people that bought at the high, they're, they're wrecked. Those kinds of things perpetuate the wrong kind of narrative. It's an affront to reality. And now, we have huge companies, and I have nothing fundamentally against Binance, by the way, but we have huge companies with huge budgets taking major stakes in that traditional media. Binance, if you guys don't know, just put $200 million into Forbes, making them the second largest shareholder in a 150-plus-year-old organization. That has, in recent months, published articles that are negative in terms of Binance. Now, CZ says that, you know, the, uh, the journalistic integrity of the Forbes writers will remain sacrosanct. I'm skeptical. All right, media sucks, we know that. Who here is aware of CBDCs? Okay, good amount, nice one. CBDCs, for those that don't know, are central bank digital currencies and they're a fucking scam, absolutely a scam. And essentially, <laughs> it's interesting because I read a lot about this stuff, and initially CBDCs were talked about in this light that was like, oh, you know, maybe we can leverage this technology to make cross-border payments more simplified, maybe it can be you know, more transparent, uh, you know, maybe it can be more efficient, eliminating a lot of the administrative costs of you know, central banking and payments networks. And then they realized, you know, okay, there's stable coins out there, maybe we can just leverage those. Stable coins, there's a variety of different approaches to stable coins, algorithmic, rebase, uh, and of course the ones that are backed by supposedly hard assets. Then they realized something. Oh shit, if we make these things tender, it obviates a lot of the things that we make money on as bankers, right? The payments networks also realize that they are no longer required with CBDCs. So what did they do? Actually, and this is literally, if we go back, February 2nd was this first article. February 7th, they changed the narrative. Days went by and they changed the narrative. Stable coins are not the future of payments. No, that's not gonna work for us. It's only gonna work if we are the ones that can create the CBDCs. What's wrong with basically every market right now? It's, it's the bubble of all things. Created by the falsification and debasement of the currency that we all work so hard to earn. Quantitative easing, you guys familiar with that concept? They print money out of thin air, they shove it into the equities markets so that your pension fund looks good and your 401k looks good. Meanwhile, they're giving 1% loans to BlackRock so they can buy every house in your neighborhood and rent it back to you. <laughs> what do you think they're gonna do when they can just press a button instead of actually printing? <laughs> it's a tool for surveillance. There's no privacy, and we're already seeing this in China. We're gonna see it in Russia. I'll talk about that in a second. Easily censored. In China, they have proposed that the money that they create through their CBDC, the digital yuan, can actually have an expiration date. <laughs> an expiration date on your... Test. Oh, I thought they hated my speech that much. So that, that is completely at odds with what cryptocurrency is, right? It's also centralized as hell. 
And as I said, you can, send, you can inflate at the click of a button. So what's wrong from our perspective? If you can't figure it out, it's pretty simple. Transparency. They don't want that. They don't want us to know exactly what's happening in the monetary supply. During the pandemic, they lowered the fractional reserve requirement to fucking zero. <laughs> that means the bank that you have your money lent to, and, and by the way, when your money's in the bank, it's not a checking account. It's a loan at negative interest to the bank. They can use the money against you, trade in the markets, buy your houses, whatever they want. They don't want you to see how little money they have on hand. And as I said, the centralized payment providers go poof with CBDCs. In fact, do we even need the banks with CBDCs? Maybe the government just says, oh, well, we'll just write the software and we'll just, we'll just handle this. We don't need the banks anymore. Now it's fully controlled by the government, which leads me to the government, regulations. Probably not for the best. They don't know what they're talking about. They've made that incredibly clear. Now, we, we are making changes. I have seen some new, uh, some new entrants into, uh, into Congress in the United States that are pro-crypto, which is a step in the right direction. But there's no, there's no weeding them out from the inside. You can't become part of the government and then you know, change things from within. Rarely does that work, and rarely does that happen. The other problem is it's not just the US. There's 195 countries out there. And they're all going to have different rules. Look at this. So we have two articles that look very similar, right? Russia moves to recognize crypto as a form of currency. OK, that sounds pretty good. In Global First, El Salvador adopts Bitcoin as a currency. Sounds pretty good, too. Here's the difference. Russia is only going to allow you to use interfaces that they control and track. This is not big for Bitcoin adoption. This isn't like a huge move for the space, it's bad. It's bad. Decentralization is at risk. El Salvador, on the other hand, now they do have a centralized wallet, which of course they can look at, but they allow you to use any wallet, any decentralized wallet, nodes, whatever. They're using it as a real currency, they're mining it, they're supporting the ecosystem. That's adoption. How about uh, on our home base? Who's from the US? Good amount. So, Biden has been for like, I don't know, a month and a half, saying that he's going to release some executive order uh, on cryptocurrency, basically giving the power to these special interest groups that also don't know what the hell they're talking about, by the way. And just a couple months ago, back in January, the infrastructure bill. You guys remember that? Bad for everyone. Nothing good <laughs> came of that thing. But tucked inside that bill, they made it possible to tax literally anyone who interacts with cryptocurrency literally, even the node operators. How do you enforce that? That just shows me right there, you don't know what you're talking about. And now, oh yeah, now we got Trudeau, who, if you're a North American person like myself, is right upstairs. And he is showing that he doesn't care. Literally allowing banks to close accounts without a court order, no due process, just shut down, including crypto exchanges. So this is a problem as well, to choke off protest funding. If it wasn't that, it would be terrorism. If it wasn't that, it would be some drug cartel or money laundering or whatever they want to say. It's always something that has nothing to do with us, that has a small impact, if any. And it's just, take a little bit, take a little bit, until it's all fucking gone. The only thing that can regulate crypto, first of all, let me just say this. There's no such thing as regulation of technology. You can't actually regulate technology. You regulate the interfaces with which people use technology. You regulate the companies that build things for those technologies. The internet in the United States isn't really regulated, but Google is, right? Bitcoin is not regulated. The only thing that regulates Bitcoin is this. Code, consensus. Decentralized peers finding consensus. Don't, don't believe that, you know, checking a box on your IRS form is, is regulation. Because you don't have to check it. Okay, which leads me to custody. So if you guys aren't afraid of third-party custodial solutions by now, 
I've just failed and this has been a terrible presentation, but hopefully you understand that custody allows the new world to become the old world. The oppressed becomes the oppressor. If we just turn around and make the same thing but online, then why are we doing this? It makes no sense. And uh, this is a custodial wallet. Anything where you, as, as Paul said, and Paul, I see him over there, but good friend of mine, we're both from San Diego, both working on a similar thing, different approaches. Self-custody is important because when you give your money to a custodial solution, you're basically doing the same thing when you put your money in a bank. Except there's even less regulations. There's even less chance that the person who screws you over gets in trouble or there's any justice. Self-custody is the oppressed becoming liberated. This is why they're so scared. Somebody asked me the other night at the, uh, at the fire dancing thing, like, do you think the government is actually scared? And I said, yeah, I think they actually are. I think at first, maybe not. I think at first they thought, oh, it'll just fizzle out, it'll go away. But now, it's not going away. It's become a $2 trillion market and, and growing. We become liberated when we take control of our finances with self-custodial wallets, like Divi Wallet or like Edge. It's very, very important that you own your keys. Because at any time, no matter where you live, I don't care if you're in the United States, we're seeing it in Canada, they can flip a switch and say, actually, that, that Constitution thing, I'm cool with that. Get, get that out. So, what can we learn? from the eras of the past. First of all, we don't want to make sacrifices, right? When we sacrifice for convenience, we make a huge mistake in the way that we build things, right? We sacrificed our privacy for convenience and for fair elections. <laughs> we sacrificed our free speech for convenience on Twitter. And they'll just ban anybody. Same with Spotify. They'll just ban anybody who doesn't agree with the agenda that they are promoting no matter what. And we're sacrificing decentralization for convenience. Just because it's easier to make a custodial doesn't mean that we should. As a builder in this space, if anybody is building things in this space, why are you trying to build anything that doesn't leverage the actual technology? Companies like the one on the, on the screen and others, who I won't mention out of respect, they are just regular web two companies. They just use a database to facilitate all the transactions and trades. And they hold your money and do stuff with it the whole time. So this is uh, the only part of the thing where I'll show my thing, but uh, if you can press play on that, that would be sweet. I don't know if it works. No? All right, I'll just tell you about it. So. Divi Wallet, uh, Divi is a, is a project that I started back in 2017 with uh, the philosophy of creating a decentralized ecosystem of finance that basically consolidated the value chain across the traditional tech and finance world as well as the crypto world. Uh, in 2018, we launched our patent pending Mochi, which allows you to deploy a master node with the click of a button, start earning 20% on your coins. And we just launched staking vaults, which allow you to do that, both of those things from a mobile device. Uh, it's a cool wallet. Download it, DiviWallet.com. Uh, I was hoping that I could show you one other thing. Some of the stuff we've done for the community down here in Mexico and in, and in Venezuela and in uh, South Africa. See, I, I, know, I know I just said a bunch of buzzwords about what I do, but I really want to see an impact for what we do, right? So um, down in Venezuela, we have a, a community of people. This guy Ramos is an amazing man. He has created a circular economy using our coin to help facilitate the, the, uh, the feeding of literally hundreds of people every single week in his village. Um, and it's all done with Divi. Um, out in South Africa, we got 101 kids bicycles during the pandemic so they could keep going to school uh, when all of the tr transit was closed down. And here in Mexico, we've worked with the Marsh Children's Home several times uh, to teach them tech skills, um, donate computers and things like that. Um, I love those kids. That's how I know Danny as well. So. Um, Look, we have a choice as consumers, we have a choice as builders to create the decentralized future that was envisioned for us. We don't have to 
fall into the Milton Friedman doctrine BS that has generated every big corporation that exists that holds us under their thumb. We don't have to let the markets of this world become manipulated by people that don't give two shits if we exist, that only deflate our, or inflate our currency and debase our ability to spend, putting us in a perpetual cycle of working and working and working and getting less out of it no matter how productive we are. We don't have to do that. Cryptocurrency is the answer to that, but only if we make it decentralized. So, thank you. Yeah.